same. Welcome to Micro Bakery 101. This is a webinar for budding, ready business folk. Um, and we've you got four time. panelists today uh, who will uh, be answering some questions, telling you bits and bobs about the business of running a micro bakery. They are all experienced micro bakers themselves, uh, and they will be giving you some top tips. Uh, and after that, we'll be taking some questions. So those of you who are at this right now as we're recording it, uh, we'll be taking some of your questions. Um, and I think we'll get going. Uh, one thing to say is this is actually the launch event of the uh, crowdfunding campaign we're running to publish Need to Know More, which is the updated and expanded 10th anniversary edition of our essential micro bakery handbook. Uh, we launched that yesterday, in fact, and actually we're about 76% funded already. So we're doing really well towards our basic target, but we still need more. The more we get, the more we can do around micro bakery, the book itself, uh, but beyond that, sort of looking at live events. So uh, I will now hand over to uh, Jane Mason, uh, who will be able to give you a brief introduction to herself and then talk to you for about 10 minutes. Over to you, Jane. Hey, um, it's actually super interesting doing this because although I can see that there are 213 participants, I can actually only see like six um, people themselves. So it's a great deal less intimidating than if I was seeing like 200 live people. So uh, it's, it's a very intimate way of addressing a lot of you. So thank you so much, Chris, for organizing. Um, as Chris said, my name is Jane Mason, and um, I set up Virtuous Bread about 10 years ago. Chris and I were um, absolutely together at the beginning of this bread lark in the UK and started talking 10 years ago about bread and micro bakeries and uh, the Real Bread campaign and the Need to Know book and how we wanted to change the world through bread. And with the help of every other micro baker and indeed the people on this call, um, I think that together we have made an extraordinary impression on the quality of bread, not only in the UK, but also actually all over the world. And we can see that actually in the UK because we know that the sale of you know, white sliced industrial loaf has over the past decade fallen in favor of bread that is better made. We know that there are more bakeries, more micro bakeries, more really good quality bread bakers. And um, that's just all such satisfying news. And I'm sure the panelists agree and, and have a ton to say on it. Um, what I was going to talk to you about today very quickly, uh, Chris asked me to talk about you know, maybe the five questions you want to ask yourself before deciding to set up a micro bakery. Now, listen, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure all of us are concerned, if you are baking a few extra loaves of bread at home and selling them to your neighbors, you are a micro baker. And um, we all think that's fantastic. If you want to maybe take it a little bit further and expand it a bit and set up what you more, you know, you, you personally would say, oh, you know, I have a business versus I'm just working from my kitchen table. There are some things that you may want to think about. So I'm going to just talk to you about what those are. And the first of my five questions for you, if we were sitting down and chatting and I was going to coach you on this, would be what's behind your desire to do this? So um, is this going to be a side hustle? Um, is it going to be a hobby? Do you just kind of love to bake and you want to see if you can take it a step further? Um, is it a fulfillment of a dream that you have? Or are you actually hoping, you know, or, you know, you have this idea that you want to set up a business, a bread business? And so the first thing I think you need to do is maybe get a notebook, get a pen, and write about why am I doing this? You know, what's behind my desire? What's really fueling my desire to set up a micro bakery? And I think that's a really important exercise because it takes you to the next question. And the next question I would ask you is, what is your level of ambition? And as I say, you know, baking an extra loaf a week and selling it to a neighbor, that's a great ambition uh, because you're providing that person with a product that they wouldn't otherwise get and it may be a better quality product. I'm certain it is a better quality product than anything they might be able to buy locally. So if that is your level of ambition, that's a fantastic level of ambition. You might have a bigger level of ambition. You might say, I want to have a business that will fully support me. 
you know, why am I doing it? I see an opportunity in the market and I want to have a business that will fully support me financially. That's a very big level of ambition. You might say, I want to have a business that fills a hole. You know, I just, I need an extra hundred pounds a week. That would make me a little bit more comfortable. And so what my level of ambition is, is to have a business that fills a hole. Fantastic ambition. Okay. Another ambition could be, I want a business that gives me a little bit of extra pocket money. You know, I'm saving for a holiday. I'm saving for a new scooter. I don't know, it doesn't matter. I'm saving for a new sweater. Um, that doesn't matter either. So, you know, I think it's really important though to think about as the second question is what is my level of ambition? Because that one gets you to the third question, okay? And the third question that I would ask you to ask yourself is what do I need, okay? And then you might think, okay, I need more time. I don't have time to realize my ambition. How am I going to make more time in my life to do this? I need more space. Uh, my kitchen's super small. I have a little teeny weeny oven. I need more space. I have nowhere to proof my dough, right? I need more space to realize my ambition. You might think um, I need equipment. I need a mixer. I can't do this by hand anymore. I need more tins. I need more baskets. I need more bowls. You know, I need a I need a proofing chamber. I need another refrigerator, right? There are lots of things depending on your level of ambition that you might need. And a really important one there is I might need knowledge. I might need some coaching. I might need advice. Okay. There are books. The Real Bread Campaign has a fantastic book that provides you with knowledge. Um, there are various micro bakery courses out there that provide you with knowledge. And usually, I think in my experience, what I find is the knowledge breaks down into three categories. One is bread, right? Can I bake good enough bread? Great concern. Second one is how do I feel about selling and marketing my bread? Maybe I've never done that. Maybe that makes me uncomfortable. So how do I go about doing that? And the third one is I have never set up and run a small business before. I need knowledge about setting up and running a small business. So that would be the kind of questions, a basket of questions in my third question, which is what do I need? Fourth question, how much do I need? Do I need money to realize the things that I need in order to set up my business? Okay, add it up, you're gonna get to a number. Or not, if you're lucky, maybe you have everything that you need, which is terrific, but maybe there are things that you need. And then the fifth question is, where do I get it? Okay, do I go to a bank? Do I crowdfund it? Do I have savings? Do I go to private investors? And it's really only at that stage and only if you go to a bank that you're going to need a business plan, which is a thing that intimidates a lot of people. But you don't need a business plan for no reason. You only need a business plan really fundamentally if you're going to go to a bank for a loan or go to private investors. And a business plan is not as scary as it sounds. To do a business plan, you answer the five questions I've outlined. And that is your business plan. Um, you know, and, and obviously you need a number in there about what you think you're going to sell, how many loaves, for how much money. And that's really all part of your questions, why are you doing this, and what's your level of ambition? So I hope, Chris, that that met your expectations of, you know, what are the five things with a few more questions involved that I may need to ask myself before I set up my business? Thank you, Jane. Yes, certainly that's a very good five starters. Obviously, there are a million questions, but those are five key, five key ones. Uh, what, what Jane mentioned about there being lots of courses uh, and guides out there, Jane uh, founded the, the Bread Angels Network and they run courses all over the place, not only about how to make bread, but also how to uh, run your micro bakery business. So uh, while we're all getting shameless plugs in there, I thought I'd do it for her. Thank um, you. You're welcome. So thank you for that. Uh, keep your questions coming in the Q&A down at the bottom. Uh, I'm very happy to say a lot of those are ones that we do cover in our book. So it's, uh, there's a couple of things that I need to add in when, when I'm rewriting it. So that's fantastic. Uh, so next is Ian Waterland, um, who runs his own microbakery and is also a tutor on microbakery, amongst other things, at the School of Arts and Food. 
Thank you, Chris. Hello, everyone. Yes, uh, my name's Ian. I literally was a hobby baker eight years ago before retraining from a career in mental health into the bread world. And I have to say, partway through my training of a year, the Need to Know original book was one of the first things I came across. So it's partly your fault, Chris, and partly the Real Bread Campaign's fault. Um, I'm really expanding on something Jane mentioned about sort of the why area. So obviously sourdough, real or otherwise, is pretty much av available everywhere these days, um, but it varies a lot. So it may have been made the day before and moved by van or lorry to a distribution centre and then again in another lorry or van to a multiple retailer like the supermarkets. It could have been baked off in store having arrived chilled or even made in store from a powdered chemical instant sourdough mix, a magical sourdough without the time. The alternative picture is that it could have been made slowly, by hand, local to where it's sold, from stone ground or even locally grown population wheat. It could have been milled, wheat milled on the day for freshness. It could be sold still warm from the bakery, from the oven delivered by bike, sold direct to customers from the bakery window or a bread shed. The differences between the first descriptions and the second are important. And if you're going to create a successful micro, ba micro bakery, then I would suggest what it looks like, what it produces and how it produces it, should be communicated carefully to your potential and returning customers. So in other words, I think your bakery's ethos, style and individuality is what will bring your customers to your door, van, stall or shop, rather than to Waitrose or Walmart. It won't just probably be because you're selling sourdough, because as I say, that is available a lot more than it used to be. If you do a search on Walmart's website today on, for sourdough, you'll get 55 products that come up. So they don't need to come to you for sourdough, they need to come to you for other reasons. So ethos, I think, is the why, which is following on from what Jane said. Why are you planning on running a micro bakery? So apart from a few fast growing and multiple outlet exceptions, which possibly are not micro bakeries anymore, if you're going into micro bakery just for the money, then you may well want to think again and go for Bitcoin or something different. Um, it might not just be about the money. For me, my ethos is producing slow process, good quality, real bread to meet a local need. With low food miles, uh, I like to engage with my customers and run a sustainable solo business over the long term. So I'm sort of seven, eight years in now. And on top of that, bread education. I like teaching people the joys of real bread. So that's what floats my boat and that makes the sort of fairly long hours and modest income worthwhile. But for you, it could be any number of other things. The reasons, it could be the best products. It could be providing employment. It could be flexible working, being your own boss just being creative, productive, it could be ancient grains, it could be supplying a cafe, partnering with another food operation, it could be any number of things. But knowing why you're setting up a bakery, bakery defining your ethos is key, because I think without it, your business can drift and you can be pulled in the wrong direction and perhaps most importantly, take a direction that leaves you unsatisfied, or even downright miserable. So if you know why you're doing it, you can make an informed decision and say no to approaches from new customers who don't fit your ethos. Um, and it's really tempting, especially in the early days, to say yes to everything. Um, I did a bit of that and I learned to regret it. And I have to say the things that I said yes to at the start, which don't fit my ethos, I am no longer doing. But the things I did at the start that fit my ethos, 
I'm still doing now. So I've got customers who live 100 metres from where I make the bread. Seven years on, they're still buying it because that was part of my key ethos. And that's not to say you can't have guided evolution and thoughtful changes, but not sort of knee-jerk reactions and throwing the baby out of the bathwater and changing things because people have approached you. So careful thinking about why. Um, how you communicate your ethos to your potential and then hopefully regular and repeat customers uh, is by the style of your bakery and its offering. So the branding, the images you use, they're the visual representation of your style. So I think you need to think about those things very carefully, the color palette, the consistency of your imagery, photos, video, and what sort of verbal content you're offering to people. And you need to really think about how you produce that content and what channels and social media platforms are suitable. The most important thing is you've got to match those channels to your identified customer base. So researching your customer base, your target customer is really key. Um, for your content in the honourable traditions of the BBC, you might be wanting to inform, educate and entertain, or you might just be wanting to do one of those but link it to your content. Uh, so it could be perhaps stone ground flour, sourdough, those are key things for you. So if you explain to people why you're interested in those, that it helps them understand your business, your products, and attracts them into your business. I would also say your style needs to match the values that underpin your ethos. It's no good talking about sustainability, and then wrapping your loaves in single-use plastic. That's not going to work. So it's about being consistent. Individuality, probably the, the final area of those three I'm going to cover. This is one of the most important areas that distinguishes you from the multiple retailers. And it's the reason why people will come to you rather than the supermarket. So it's the area that sets you aside and the multiples just can't do this. They can't be individual. Even some smaller retailers can't deal with it either. But as a micro baker, you can tailor your offering and your systems to individual customers. You can open up individual channels of communication and that converts into a level of service that just can't be beaten by bigger operations. So one example, at the last count, I had five different ways that customers pay for their loads. I've got older customers who use cash, I've got people who do bank transfers. I've got standing orders. I've got people who run up a debt and then pay it off. And no matter how you try and get around that, that's the way they operate. And I've got people who pay me a lump of cash up front and then it dwindles down as they buy their loads. And then I tell them when I need more money. Those multiple channels, multiple methods, are things that big retailers can't do. Similarly with orders. I've got customers who order one of each loaf I do every week. I've got other customers who choose which loaves they want each week. And I've also got a customer who only buys one loaf that I make. So when I make that loaf, she will buy several and she'll store them, freeze them. But if I don't get an email from her with an order when I do that loaf, because I know that she likes it, I'll drop her a message. And that usually converts into a big order. Now that level of customer service translating into orders is something multiples just can't do. So I think it also works the other way around. So part of the sort of ethos of my bakery communication is that I'm just really honest with people. So the example I always give is that one day I had a nice mixer full of baguette dough, water lazing, and I had a load of vine fruits on the side, which I was using for another loaf. And it was quite early in the morning. Without thinking, I tipped all of the fruit into the baguette dough. So after a couple of minutes of panic, I jumped onto social media and I messaged out to tell people exactly what I'd done and that the baguettes would now be fruit baguettes. And when I turned up for sale that day, it was the first product that sold out. People absolutely loved them and they asked for them and I still do them now. So that's just that customer service, that communication you can have with people as a micro baker. Um, 
individuality also means I can respond to um, a seasonal ingredient that comes round. I can do a special at the last minute. Um, and as happened recently, there was a, some small issue with a virus or something. Um, I managed to swap from parking my bread van up to delivery without missing a week's production and sales. So it gave me that flexibility. So in summary, I would say your ethos, why you're running a micro bakery, your style, how you communicate this to your customers and your individuality are the points of difference between you and others selling bread. And that's why the reason, that's the reason why you will be successful as a micro baker. Back to you, Chris. Fantastic, thank you, Ian. So uh, keep your questions coming in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you're watching this live, you're here at the actual webinar rather than watching the recording. Uh, and our next speaker is uh, Sonia Handel, who uh, runs a bakery from a, it's a converted stable, is it? You'll be able to correct me. Um, very nice wood-fired oven in there. Um, I will stop waffling and pass over to you. Hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining this uh, this session. Um, I have been thinking because I, I don't want to repeat the wonderful things that Jane and Ian have said, but there's lots of things that each of them have said that have really resonated with me. Um, but what I want to do is be very honest and uh, and say that you know. I'm, you know, this is like 13, 14 years after I set up the bakery. And from this point, it's very, very easy for me to look back and say, well, yes, of course, this worked and that's why I'm here now. And this why I'm doing this and that and that. Um, and the reality is that I did really spend the first um, two or three years feeling my way around what being a baker was. Um, and I have done, like Ian, I have done an awful lot of different markets and collaborations and supplying delis and restaurants and what, whatever special events, one-off medieval feasts, you name it, I've done it. And um, the thing that's still here that hasn't changed are the individual customers. And, and I'm like Ian, I've still got the same customers who came to the first bread tasting 14 years ago just to see what, what I was going to do. And um, that personal connection, is, to me, is the thing that's um, stayed the course, really. My personal connection with my customers, they, they end up, they do end up becoming friends. They end up doing things like when I have a disaster and, um, you know, the that couldn't get the oven to get to the right temperature, they'll go and pick up my kids from school. Um, last year, my mum was very ill in the hospital and a customer came and collected the bread and did half the deliveries for me. So, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a sort of, I guess I'm a, a small, ba mostly a small bakery. I've become smaller after the pandemic. I've gone back perhaps to more of the things that, the way that I was working in the first, originally, um, but that connection has never has not been lost. So customers have changed over the years. I've got different places that I go to, but there's a core group, and they're very. We talk a lot. You know, I understand their preferences. They send me little messages on whatever social media platform, and it's lovely. I really appreciate it. And so, therefore, I get customers who bring me seasonal fruits, logs that they've chopped down from their garden and all sorts. So there's been all kinds of really interesting um, uh, kind of like, kind of cro like cross lots of different crossovers because now I've started to get involved with projects where someone's come about the bread and then I've started to do something else um, related to that. So that's this point now, which all sounds great, right? Sounds like I'm having a great time. But what I actually wanted to talk about were, um, was actually the practicalities. How do you want, so you, you know, you're well done, right? You're at, you're at the point, you've got some good bread. You like it, other people like it. This is brilliant, okay? This is a really good place to be. And you think, hmm, other people want me to supply a bit of bread. Where am I gonna go, okay? So uh, I think, and I did this this morning, you need to, I won't show you all the, the, the writing. I think you need to write stuff down 
and you need some columns that say, uh, what's my ideal, right? What's my ideal bakery? How would I like to work? Um, how many days do I want to do? What would my space look like? What equipment do I want? And then break that down and do the pros and cons of each of them. And then do an honesty column with what can you actually live with? What can you actually do? Okay, and so I did this with like, why did I end up with a wood fired oven, right? I'm a, I'm not a baker or a chef or anything foodie by training. I'm a, a drama graduate who ended up in retail and supply and logistics management. Okay, very handy for running bakery uh, logistics. Um, so I, I didn't know anything about ovens or baking equipment. So that came about because I didn't have enough money to buy an electric oven or put electricity into this, um, in, into this building because the building had to be rebuilt. So when Chris talks about the bakery being in a converted stable, the stable was literally a roof and some pillars. There was no floor. So, you know, the wood fired oven came about because it was the cheapest thing. So the next question was, well, how would I ever learn to use one of these? These aren't very common. Nobody has one. No sane baker would set up a bakery using one of these. Um, there's a wonderful guy in Devon, um, uh, Paul Mary at Pannery. He has one, he imports them, right? So there's a connection. So I went on a course, I learned how to use one, discovered I absolutely love setting fire to things. So uh, I thought, well, if I, if I just keep meeting that need, fulfilling that need every week of setting fire to stuff, this business is gonna be fine, right? So I loved it. And then, so with that idea came a whole sort of sustainability uh, about, well, look, if we have a wood-fired oven, maybe we need to plant some trees and think about maybe six years, seven years down the line, becoming fully, fully um, uh, supplying our own wood. So we planted some wood here and on a friend's farm. And so all these things, so I start to become part of, of the, really the bakery has become part of my lifestyle. Uh, in, and my per, my personality is from you know my relationship with my customers and like Ian said it, it, my ethos and values are all connected to this because I'm sure I would have been a much would have made a bit more money actually with an electric oven and been a little bit more efficient but there's nobody else stuck out in the middle of nowhere working with a wood fired oven commercially that I know of in this country and who actually grows some of the wood and can just go 10, 10 miles down the road to pick up the flower from a windmill. So there's a lot of things there that mean something to me and they mean something to my customers who also like the bread, right? They don't just buy your bread for the ethos and the values. You still have to produce the, the goods at the end of the day. But taking some time to sit down and just put down, you know, ideally, I would have liked a fantastic all singing or dancing um, deck oven like I'd seen and um, actually couldn't afford it. Uh, got this one in, went on a course which was brilliant and um, then didn't have any money for equipment in the bakery. So I then had to scale everything back. You know, I knew I needed a mixer, but I couldn't have racking. I couldn't get the boards or the covers or the couches or anything. I improvised, I used plastic, uh, boxes that were food safe. Um, I thought about all those things, but I was almost working in a completely empty shell. I bought lots of equipment secondhand. So think about those things. Um, and I guess the, I mean, I could go into lots of detail, but what I really want to say is the other thing that is very, very important is please make connections with other bakers and please go on courses and meet other people because you will just gain so much from collaborating and sharing stuff you know with other people. And I just, this is my personal, right, this is my personal beef, okay? Uh, I love helping people. I love working with other people. I have enjoyed every event that I've ever been asked to go to where I get to work with other bakers and have a bit of fun. Um, but I really don't like that one person that comes up and tries to mine me for every single piece of baking information that I've ever had. And I even had it happen on a market where someone came and asked me everything about how I'd set up in the market, how, what markets I did. And the, the damn guy just followed me around everywhere. I came to a market, he had a market store and he was just, you know, and I just think, well, he, he's still not, he's not around anymore. But um, what I want to say is, 
if you want to learn, do it, collaborate, right? Contribute, share, take part. Um, don't try and reinvent the wheel in your space, right? There's so much wonderful information out there. There's so many fantastic people you can spend time with and learn from. Just go and do it, right? Your wonderful bread will, people are still going to be interested in it if you share your skills and learn skills with other people. So that's, that's my big learning. Other people, right? It, your business works the more you give and receive from other people. There you go. I hope that was 10 minutes. <laughs> You've got 45 seconds left. Bang on. Thank you very much. Well done. I must say thank you very much to my panellists, not only for being here uh, and taking the time to share to their knowledge and their experiences and their passion for, for running uh, for real bread and running micro bakeries, but for sticking to time. It makes, uh, makes this very, very easy for me. Um, so uh, keep the questions coming, please. There, there are some great questions. What I'm sort of starting to think is we'll try and rattle through as many of these as we can after we've heard uh, from Matt in a moment, uh, but also I think we'll see if we can uh, maybe sort of put some of those online with, with growing some uh, answers from the panellists as well. And I must say, plug again, uh, and Need to Know More book actually covers pretty much every uh, question that's been asked at the moment, so that's uh, reassuring to know. Right, move on to Matt Townley, uh, who is, uh, th this event is being run by the Real Bread campaign, but we're we're connecting with uh, other networks and organisations working uh, around real bread and particularly micro bakery today. So uh, we've uh, we've uh, we've heard from uh, Jane from Virtuous Bread Bread Angels, uh, Ian who is uh, representing School of Arts and Food today, and Matt is uh, part of the One Mile Bakery Network. Um, over to you, Matt. Okay. Hi, everyone. So uh, yeah, I I really enjoy events like this. It's um, a little bit nerve-wracking as a panelist, but it's really inspiring to hear the um, the experiences from uh, uh, Janie and Anne Sonia as well. Um, particularly hearing about new experiences such as converting a stables from pretty much pillars uh, and no floor um, to using uh, wood wood oven fires, which the prospect for me it sounds really daunting. I only use it for pizza, really, but I know that it's a whole other world to it than pizza. So, um, as Chris has said, I'm part of um, One Mile Bakery. Uh, I operate in Hale, Greater Manchester, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about my journey. Uh, just like these guys um, have said, everybody has their own journey. Uh, everybody is in a different position. Everybody lives in a different house. Everybody has a different bake potential baking environment. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, my journey uh, and what I've, what I've learned so far. So originally, I'm a primary school teacher uh, by profession. Uh, I was teaching in a classroom. Uh, and as I'm sure, well, statistically, there will probably be teachers uh, in the audience right now. Uh, and they will be thinking about their own stressful, uh, busy lives. I was becoming that parent uh, that I was seeing as a, as a teacher, always late for the drop off, always the very last person to collect uh, our daughter Olivia just at the end of uh, after school club she was doing she, she just turned four she was doing 10 hour days at school uh, and as a parent that's uh, that's hard to take um, and uh, in the background I was sort of taking up sort of earthy pastimes particularly to do with food I've always enjoyed food making food for people uh, I love hosting and giving people a really good meal uh, and I got into baking bread and it, the first challenge was making a bread that wasn't a brick. Um, I think that's usually the first, the first hurdle that everybody comes up. Thanks to the Chorleywood bread process, we've got that disconnect where we don't have that knowledge that goes down through generation to generation. We have the convenience of going to the shop to buy our bread. Anyway, um, I was baking a fair bit of bread and enjoying that. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear about Ian's uh, background in mental health and particularly through bread because that was exactly me um, I baked uh, through bereavement basically uh, my mother-in-law uh, had died of cancer and we weren't this was all within about a 18 month period my mother-in-law died of cancer my my dad uh, had a pretty catastrophic mental breakdown and ended up taking his own life uh, 
my wife Suze had a ruptured ectopic pregnancy when we were in uh, Greece on holiday of all places and was rushed to hospital was about two two hours away from death and so something like food and creating things for people that they can eat uh, was um, a very therapeutic thing for me um, and I learned about the concept of one mile bakery uh, Sue sent me the details of it and said, you know, you'd love this. The concept is pretty simple. You bake from home, you deliver it locally and you share your own knowledge with other people. They come into your home and you teach them how to, how to bake bread, whether it's uh, sourdough or French baking, Italian, uh, and so on. Um, you have a nice lunch with some wine and uh, that's what it's all about. So I, ticked all the boxes for me so i got in touch with elizabeth mahoney who is uh the founder of one mile bakery and that was the start of me as a as a micro baker uh, it appealed to me because all of the branding the web side of things that was all set up so making that jump into starting a, a small business uh it became less of a a, a difficult thing for for me to uh, do i could concentrate on the huge learning curve of uh, learning to make and deliver different types of bread um, and for me it's always been about the the potential of trying new things uh, there are so many variables to baking bread it's incredible there are only four ingredients you've got flour water salt and a leavening agent but those four things can come in a variety of different ways what kind of pre-ferments are you going to use you know what uh what type of salt are you going to do what sort of fluid you know before before you know it I'm, i've stopped using stuff from the tap i'm raiding the fridge using pickle juice from jars of gherkins getting it in the dough experimenting with all of these things and, and trying the results uh, before i know it, i'm making more bread than i can eat and i'm giving it to neighbors and so on and um and it and it becomes a you know a, a fun uh, re uh gratifying thing to do uh bought some kits i bought a rothko oven uh, a hobart uh, 15 kilo mixer that was probably from the arc uh, i went to a bakery that was closing down a wholesale bakery in stockport it was a, a turkish bakery and uh, it was pretty comedic actually because uh, we went in with both of our haggling cultures so i, I he offered th 300 pounds for his uh, for his hobart mixer and i thought to myself right okay so i tried to whittle him down to 150 no no Anyway, I ended up paying the full price, which just goes to show I just had classically British haggling skills. Um, so got a Hobart mixer. I've now got a, uh, an Italianox Prisma uh, two, 20 kilo uh, spiral mixer uh, and about three domestic fridges. Um, as you increase your capacity, you realize that actually you need to increase the capacity of your, uh, of your uh, retarding equipment as well. And so... Uh, just be mindful of that. Um, it depends on whether you're working out of your garage, in your home kitchen, whether you've got a cellar or not, or keep these things in mind. Um, I was delivering to new customers. And for me, one of the really great things was about building rapport with new customers, discovering people's likes and dislikes and taking them on a bit of a journey. Um, the, the price side of things, I did see a question pop up asking about how to keep things uh, affordable. There's no getting away around the fact that this is going to be a premium product. Um, the very nature of the fact that everything's generally made by hand with premium ingredients uh, and delivered locally means that really we're not, I myself anyway, I'm not in the business of competing with supermarkets. If you do that, it's, it's not going to end particularly well for you. But what you can compete with is the quality of service and the quality of product that you're giving uh, to people. Um, and yeah, each week I'm delivering a, a different type of bread. I think over, over about 200 varieties I've had a bash at uh, over the last three years or so, uh, whether that's in the form of different shapes like Winston Knot, Six Braid Hallet, um, bagels, honey and lavender, cheese and marmite, cheese and chili, olive, spent grain. This is endless. And, you know, my customers who choose that aspect are also really adventurous and they're breadheads. They're more than willing to take a 20, you know, 40 minute round trip simply for a loaf of bread. Um, and for those people out there who are looking to set up their micro bakery, those are the people who you're going to be marketing to. Very, very passionate about their bread. Um, in terms of the classes that I do, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting one. Um, 
it, it was so much more popular than I expected it to be. Um, and it encouraged lots of different people to come on. I thought there'd be a certain type of person, but it was everyone from retirees to students, uh, a lot of medics, um, whether that was dentists, uh, doctors, uh, paramedics, I think it's something to do with maybe the strip lighting and their own working. They, they, they want something that's a little bit more wholesome uh, at home. Uh, private investigators, had quite a lot of those. Dog walkers, uh, journalists, um, and it's for, for people coming on the classes. It's about, you know, trying something different. Uh, people seem to collect different classes. People have come on who have uh, just come back from a wood turning class uh, or beekeeping. And there are some food class collectors. Uh, I've had people come on talking about what they've enjoyed on a Rick Stein course compared to Leafs and so on. And uh, that's their niche hobby. And I wasn't expecting it. And the other thing I wasn't expecting was how many people who have come on a bread class um, for therapeutic reasons. Um, very, some of them in very similar experiences to what I've had. Um, some people coming off the back of a, uh, of a, uh, a very difficult uh, mental health uh, experience of themselves and so um but you never know about it in the class it's usually in the email afterwards where they talk about how um how beneficial it's been for them and that's really gratifying to hear um and then that took us up to about sort of 2019 late 2019 a great christmas we'd sold loads of bread bread's a great great thing to sell at christmas um, and then my kitchen assistant, who helps out during classes, talked about some rumblings going on in China about a, a virus of some kind. And then, you know, sort of drip fed more information to us because she had sort of medic friends and so on. 2020 rolls around and uh, the virus that we that we all know about um, took hold. Uh, my classes just disappeared, as you'd expect. Couldn't have anyone in. Um, and my deliveries went absolutely through the roof because there was no bread on the shelves. There was no flour on the shelves. Uh, and people were worried about the virus. People couldn't leave their homes. They wanted bread delivered to their door. And I think going back to that point about that service that you deliver and the quality of the product, it is testament to that, that about 80% of my customers have, have stayed with me through that, even though they can go back to the supermarkets and so on. Um, that really does say a lot about, you know, what it is that you're putting out. Um, I got out of the... Oh, sorry, sorry I was just going to say, yeah. Uh, have I hit seven minutes? Ten minutes you've had. Time have I? Oh, no. Sorry, guys. No, no. <laughs> absolutely. If there's one last point you want to make. Yeah, it was just just final tips, really. It was about experimenting. There's no right or, right way or wrong way. Uh, some things are set in stone. So, for example, the difference between a Poolish and a Bega. Uh, but the difference is how you use them. Uh, little tweaks and changes can elevate recipes to a new level, and it becomes your thing. Uh, stay inquisitive. Keep learning and trying new things. Uh, and get onto social media. Just like Sonia has said, there is a wealth of, uh, of experience uh, and knowledge out there by people who are very generous uh, in giving it. But as Sonia has said, um, if they want to provide a recipe, then they will uh, provide it and don't go badgering them. Um, and finally, push your own boundaries, but don't feel that you have to do it all at once. If you just want to hit sourdough, then that's absolutely fine. If you want to only do pastries, then just do pastries. It's better to do fewer things well than too much and compromise on quality. And, uh, and that's me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. Right, so that's the, the, the talks from, from our four panellists. Uh, so what I'm going to move on to now is questions. We've got about 30 or so questions in chat. Uh, I'll be picking some of those and then maybe interspersing them with some, some live questions. If uh, we can grab them from some of the participants, if I can see you. Uh, so uh, we've got actually lots of questions about pricing, um, how people come up with the prices. Do you, yeah, well, how do you calculate the prices? Uh, and the other part of the question, uh, second part of that question is really about uh, accessibility and affordability. So we've already touched on not trying to compete with supermarkets, but there's another element to that of, how do you make real bread uh, more accessible to people on lower incomes in particular? Uh, so I don't know if any of the panelists want to jump in on that question. 
Uh, you can unmute yourselves if you want to dive in there. Ian, I saw your hand first. Yeah, I'll just I'll do very briefly on the pricing if you like. There's there's various formulas out there. You can do cost plus, so you can work out what it costs you, multiply it up. You can do market pricing, where you see what other people are charging, and you can do value-based pricing, which is what you've invested in the bread and therefore what you think it's worth. But in a nutshell, you would probably use a combination of all three because you need to make sure you're not going to lose money. You want to make sure you get back what you need for what you've invested in it. And it needs to be compatible or comparable, even if it's higher than local market prices. Thank you. Uh, do any of the other panelists have any thoughts on a, the, how you set the prices, but also just, again, flipping that round on the, the affordability uh, to make sure that, uh, yeah, how to make sure that more people can afford to, to choose real bread? Uh, I think there is a, there is a, often in pricing, you get, uh, you kind of, rather than drilling down to the specific product, look at pricing in terms of a batch or of like, kind of like your, your overall output. Because what that means is you can uh, slide your, you can slide your pricing. So, and this is what people don't often realize. They think, oh, because I'm doing half, half, like a 400 gram loaf, it should be um, proportionally the same uh, sort of cost to um, sale ratio as a large loaf. Actually, they both take you the same amount of time to shape and store and to package. They usually put in the same bag. So actually you make the smaller loaves more expensive proportionally more expensive. So if you bought two small loaves, they'd be more expensive than buying one big loaf. So um, you have to think that that's like a, that comes from supply chain, I'm afraid, <laughs> it's very boring. Um, but it does, but if you're able to slide, um, if you're able to use that principle, what it means is you can then sell other products below um, uh, or at a, you know where they don't make any profit because the profit is for that for that bake or that that you know that batch is covered by the other costs and goods. So that's one way to approach um, uh, affordability for certain products. So I know lots of bakeries do this. They they will offer like a one pound loaf or a, a special um, that is that can be given in addition to or you know if you think other people can purchase for a loaf and you can donate it. So there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, it's just very, it's important to like remember you're not you're not always just trying to work out one component the, the, the price for one component you're thinking about your profit for for everything overall and then you can break it down. Thank you. Um, let's move on to another question here. Um, there are a couple of people asking around the sort of question of uh, does anything get lost when passion becomes a profession and. Someone else asking a similar question about how do you scale up your business uh, without sacrificing quality? Um, okay, I, I think those are two really different questions. I think they're extremely interesting and valuable questions, but I do think they're different. So I think there's a question about how to scale up and there's a question about does passion get lost in, in this becoming a profession? The second question um, I cannot tell you because that's a very personal circumstance. So, um, some people would say, yeah, all the magic went out when, when I started doing this as a profession, but other people would say, no, do you know, it is, it is the sum total of everything I ever wanted, which was to have a micro bakery or, you know, have a high street bakery or have a bread school or, you know, so uh, that is a very difficult question to answer and and people go into lots of different directions when they start their steps in, in in this profession so I can't answer that one scaling up there's no reason why quality should suffer in actual fact um, there are lots of reasons that you could argue that quality goes up as you scale up um, so I think there is there is knowledge to be learned and it's one of the things that you, one does need to learn how to scale up. Uh, you can talk to other bakers, you can take classes, you, you know, micro bakery classes should, mine does, address this issue of scaling up. But um, there, there, you know, it, it, I, I could argue that your quality would go up as you scaled up. 
I don't know what anyone else thinks. Please, over to you. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Um, I think it's one of those things where if, if you are a micro baker, you do have a control over the volume of, uh, of your output. Therefore, it, it should theoretically uh, mean that you are able to improve uh, that, that quality. And it actually gives you more of an impetus to, uh, to keep an eye on all of the different variables that do uh, increase the quality of each, of each unit that you're putting out so that the product can be uh, consistent and reliable. And as well as the, given the fact that you're a micro baker and this is a relatively sort of rustic way of doing bread, your, your customers and more importantly, your own mental health will thank you when you're able to keep all of those things in mind when you have that system in place. Ian, you're on mute. I was, somebody had to be first, didn't they? So, um, yeah, just echoing those points, but also about the passion side, is that as you scale up and get busier, you might feel less passionate about it, in which case it's very important to reflect on how you're feeling and how it's yeah. going. And if it's not working, change it. Because yeah. when I first started out, I got busier and busier making bread, and I found I was getting less and less happy. So I had to redress the balance and increase the teaching side to give me a balance that suited me. So mm -hmm. be reflective. And that can be difficult when you're working silly hours, but it's important. Yeah. That, that, that I, ties I, in with some, sorry to draw, I was saying that ties in with uh, some of the other questions about avoiding burnout and work-life balance. So um, do you want to carry on that? Yeah, I was I was just about to say that to do with work life balance actually because that's what is surely one of the one of the primary reasons why someone would make this change in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, being a baker comes along with long hours and early mornings or uh, night shifts is the traditional view of it. But this is your business. This is you as a baker. Are you going to bake throughout the night and do early morning drops, or are you going to bake through the day? Um, I personally, I start relatively early, um, about six ish, which for a baker is that, is, that's pretty late. Um, and my customers are usually busy, hardworking families who appreciate a late afternoon, evening delivery. Therefore, you're maintaining your own work life balance, and your customers are actually getting fresher bread at a time that's more reasonable um, to you and them. So, really, it's about matching those ideals and that's something which you can control Does anyone else have I just wanted wow. to add, add to that that I'm also a day baker the idea of working overnight with three small children in the house was just impossible I mean they're in, they're in a separate building but still I would have to I was doing the school runs uh, so uh, I think yeah like and Stick, stick to what you really, what really get, you know, what really keeps you going. You know, I only, I don't want to do markets anymore, so I'm not doing them. And I'm doing, I'm baking once a week for people I really like and doing some really other fantastically fun things in between because that's what I want to do now. Um, there was a point where I was working, uh, doing the weekly bake, doing markets three out, three out of every four weekends and supplying a deli. So, um, that's all right for a certain period of time, but I got to the point where I just thought I don't have a life anymore. I'd like some life back. So you, you can, your business, you know, it's a business, but you can make it work for your life as well. Ian, I see you've got your hands up. I know this is one of your specialist, uh, specialist subjects. It, it is, and I'll try, try and keep it brief, but I think the other thing to say is just that it's about balance. It's about, compensating it's about stress vulnerability and if anyone does want to avoid burnout then you need to invest in the positive side as much as getting stressed from potentially the negative side and the five ways to well-being is something that i'm really used a lot and i use it in my daily practice worth checking out it's well researched evidence-based so if anyone is interested that is a really really good place to go uh, mindfulness all those sorts of things are included in there so yeah, balance. So, um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to throw one more question or sort of topic out from the questions. And just wanted the panelists want to have a look in the Q&A as well, rather than me just taking control and 
being the, the gatekeeper of all of this uh, and see if there's anything after this question if you want to jump in on. Um, so the question I'm going to ask before that, though, is uh, around marketing. What are the things that uh, the microbreakers have, have found has been the, the most effective uh, tools in their marketing kit? Jane might be uh, raring to go there. Yeah, I, I, it's, so a, a couple things. One is microbreakers. Um, when you're first starting out, you're going to have quite a small production. And your best friend is, are the communities who are around you. And when you think about it, you may have more communities than you first think you have. So um, unless you live in the middle of nowhere, you have neighbors. And you may or may not know them, but I'll tell you something, if you start baking and selling bread, you will get to know them and they will be your new best friends and neighbors ever in the history of all friends and neighbors since neighbors, the Australian soap opera. It'll be even better than that um, because it gives you something to talk about, okay? So your new best friends and neighbors um, will indeed be your neighbors. You may have children who go to school. Nobody is hungrier than teachers and you can deliver to all of the teachers in the staff room. You might go to church Every Sunday, you've got a captive audience and you can go there in your car with all the bread in the back and you could sell to everybody at church in one location. You yourself may um, have a part-time job or even a full-time job embarking on a new micro bakery career. And so you've got your colleagues at your place of work. You may belong to a choir, a bowling club. You may be on a football team. You know, your children could go to gymnastics you may be part of many, many, many communities. And those are all potential groups of customers for you. And the fewer places you have to go to deliver your bread, the better, because that is a pain to have to deliver to bread to all over the place. And if you are delivering all over the place, you might wanna see if any of your customers are close by so you can drop a group of loaves off in one place so that people can pick up. So be creative about that. So that's thing number one, which is you and your customers in person. And thing number two is social media. Learn to use it, learn to love it. You don't have to have pictures of your dogs and cats and children and garden yourself on holiday. No, you can use it purely for business purposes. It's free, okay? And so it's, it, you know, learn to tame it and it's take a course. Okay, there are lots of courses on learning how to do better photography so your bread looks better on Instagram and learn how to use social media. And if, if you have any money at all, once you've set everything up, my honest piece of advice is, and it is expensive, but I believe it pays back, is get yourself a really good PR agency for at least six months. Okay, good old fashioned Press relations is something the average mortal cannot do. That's why there are people who do it. And they really, really will get you, if they're good, they'll get you coverage in broadsheets, monthly glossies, all sorts of magazines. It, it can be an excellent investment. It can be quite dear, but it can be an excellent investment. And if you can't afford that, but you can write and you can take photographs, you could go to your local newspaper or to a local magazine, um, the Church Times, the community website, and you could offer to write articles for them and for free, okay? You're not gonna get paid, but um, I'm sure that lots and lots of people would be interested in your content and that's also a great way of promoting. That's my three cents. You've got a couple of dollars worth there, actually. Um, thank you. Uh, anyone else got any uh, thoughts on what's worked for them? Mark, Matt, see your hand. Yeah, so I think I think it, it's all about identifying influencers. Now, uh, as soon as we talk about influencers, everyone starts going, oh, man. But I'm talking about the ones which Jane was talking about, which are the talkers in your local area. They won't have 100,000, a million followers. They will have about two or 300 followers. And they are the talkers who will recommend friends and so on who will come to you because they are the ones who other people will trust with their own local knowledge. Um, 
it just as an example, um, I have one of those uh, talkers who I deliver to, um, and I think I've probably had about 20, 20 odd uh, orders from her through her, uh, and she probably only has about sort of two or three hundred followers. Meanwhile, I have um, a semi-famous person who lives locally who's bought bread from me and just did a story, but just because they uh, enjoyed my bread on Instagram, I think I got one follower who I could attribute to that that post and zero sales <laughs> what what does that what does that say uh, it, it it says identify who the true influencers are and then my other point was um as as amazing as social media can be please do take it with a pinch of salt just remember that as well as all of those perfect images that you see on everybody else's feeds don't forget that there is a zoom out and you don't see all of the chaos which I'm, I'm not going to show you the chaos that's surrounding me right now, but I've got washing up that hasn't been done. I've got some, you know, bit, bits and pieces and so on. Please don't feel like everything that you do has to be perfect every single time. If you're practicing or whatever, just take that pressure off of yourself because what you're seeing on social media is everybody's best side. Right, so um, I don't know if any of your, the panelists have had a chance. Sorry, go for it, please do. I think what Matt, I think what, uh, Matt said is absolutely right. And uh, I think there are some basics that you should do. So please have some type of, whether you're on Facebook, whether you've got an email, whether you're on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever, that someone, if they want to find you, they can find you really easily. I had a website from the beginning. I, I didn't bother monitoring the traffic. I just put it up there so people knew that I existed and that it had all the details of the bakery on it. Put the really obvious things on there, how to contact you, when to contact you, what you make uh, and how much it costs, okay? Forget about making it fancy with things that slide in like this. Put the really basic information on it. Um, I looked at lots of really fancy websites and um, I looked at people who made those websites and I ended up just doing one myself because I thought they were over the top. I didn't know what, when, if I wanted a loaf, when will I get it? So, and be really clear about, you know, like for me, I'm in the middle of nowhere. So I try and make that as clear as possible to people. Um, I don't market myself to Lincoln or places like that because no one's going to come and buy the bread from there. So um, and all my, you know, I have lots of leaflets, lots of postcards and pictures of the bakery. Those things that you can give to someone, they do hold on to them and they pass them to someone else. And they, those are the people that order. Whatever, how many ever likes they get on Instagram. Instagram is a different space to my customers. Um, I'm lucky if I've got a customer who sees my Instagram feed, to be honest. But I do get some other really wonderful things happen through Instagram and social media. So don't be, you know, but focus on, as, I, as Matt and Joan have said rightly, you know, you want to be able to sell as closely as possible to where you make. So find out who those people are. I mean, honestly, like all those sort of groups that use your village hall. And, you know, I got asked at endless coffee mornings and little, you know, little food fairs. And I, I milk that school run, okay, for customers. You do it. And the teachers, and they're all hooked now. They, I can't get rid of them. So use it. <laughs> right. So um, I can see there's a couple of hands up as well. So, uh, uh people who are at this live, there's a thing at the bottom of your screen that says raise hand. Uh, you can stick your hands up, so I'll come to Liz in a minute actually there. Uh, but first panelists, uh, anyone spot any of the uh, questions that you'd like to uh, have a go at in the Q&A? Yeah, yeah. There's a, I've just shifted, there's, there's an awful lot on there. So, um, but just a few quick ones. Um, somebody had asked about insurance. So public liability, obviously, um, anything else I would say is pretty optional. Um, how do you increase your product range without decreasing quality? Um, a lot of people use a base dough and then variety off that. So split your base dough in two, add seeds to half, toasted seeds. There's lots of ways you can create a variety of breads that way. How do you attract your first customers? We've covered a lot of that, haven't we? But Use your personal contacts, 
use social media, and then a free online survey you can develop and send to everyone you know is a really good way. Um, and how many breads to start with on your product range? There's been a few questions about that. And this has already been said, but it's really important. It's something I go on about a lot on the courses I do. Start small, perfect it, and then add new loaves. Not only are you better at it, but people love a new loaf. So don't put it all out there right at the start. Start small, perfect it, and grow organically and add a new loaf when it's a good idea. There's just a few quick ones there. Fantastic. That's the sort of speed I think we're going to have to go at, to be honest. We've got, uh, we're, we're in about a question a minute for the, for the rest of the, the, uh, the session. So uh, any other palace, any that jump out at you that you want to dive in there on? Yeah, I've, I've got a couple on uh, regarding environmental health. Let me just get the question. I think it was about, uh, oh, I've lost the question now. Oh, here's yeah. one uh, from Ken Noakes. What do we HO inspectors expect to see in a home business setting? Right, okay. So local government, what permissions do you need to run a business at home? You would be surprised at how uh, helpful uh, EHOs uh, can be locally. Get in touch with your local authority and just ask them. Um, they they will they will aim they will aim to help you. It's not like uh, they're looking for pitfalls. Plus, as a home based business, actually you're at a real advantage because you will most likely have a home kitchen that will automatically tick so many boxes because a lot of food hygiene um, standards and so on they they are common sense and they're things that we all uh, adhere to anyway in our home kitchen. Therefore, it, it isn't a, it's not a huge jump. As to uh, people's uh, kitchen environments, their baking environments, I, I think I saw someone about bare brick walls. Again, uh, you know, look at, look at local eateries that have got, you know, bars with exposed brick and they've got an oven. Or, uh, if it's clean, it's clean. You, you know, it's as simple as that. You know, just get in touch with your authority and, and they'll give you... A, um, uh, lots of information but one thing that you will need to have a look at is a, uh, uh, a document called safer food better business which is uh, which is an excellent excellent resource thank you just uh, just a note to to those of you outside the uk you will have the local equivalents of those as well yeah uh, we're talking about ehos and environmental health officer in, in the uk so yes there will be depending on where you are in the world uh, there will be all sorts of uh, rules and regs get in touch with whatever your local authority is uh, and start to find guidance from them. I mean, in the UK, yes, I've heard over the last decade, lots of people say their environmental health officer or uh, food safety officer has been really, really helpful. Conversely, there are some environmental safety officers who walk in and go, what's that? What do you mean it's, what do you mean it's live? Bacteria, sourdough, what are you on about? Ah, we're all gonna die, fire, ah, we're gonna die. And people who even have uh, take exception to wooden worktops because they don't feel <laughs> adequately. So there is a range there, but yeah, do get in touch with your local environmental health officer or local authority wherever you are. Um, I'm just going to quickly start trying to take uh, some questions from live from the audience. Uh, this may or may not work, and then I'll come back to the panel. Uh, so Liz Grieve, uh, you've got a question there. Are you still there, Liz? No. Okay, I will move on. To... I'm afraid we can't hear you there, Liz. It's like a, a local radio DJ doing this. Uh, we'll, we'll have to come back to you, I'm afraid. I can't hear you. So, Suhant, uh, come to you next. Hello? Hello? Hi, Hans. Hello. Hi, uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I'm, <laughs> I wasn't super prepared for, uh, to, to be let in, but I think um, I saw a couple of questions from, uh, from people regarding the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm doing it. Wow. Oops, I think we're still getting some uh, artifacting from one of the panelists. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was just saying that um, I, since I'm doing everything uh, solo at home, it does get a little bit uh, tricky to, first of all, manage time um, just because of the lengthy process that Saudo is. And second of all, um, 
I think how how people take orders is very different. Um, I've been doing it through Instagram or WhatsApp messages and then just putting that in an Excel sheet. I know that's probably not the most efficient thing. So I just wanted to ask uh, all the panelists um, about that. So time management plus the plus how you take orders. Um, because I think that's, again, um, going back to some of the questions that others had. And again, thank you very much for, for doing this. I hope uh, answers are valuable to everyone else. Thank you. Uh, Ian, I see your hand up. Do you want to go for that one? Just unmute myself. Yeah, it was a similar question as well as uh, Suhans from Esther on the chat. Um, I do use emails and direct orders and I physically translate them onto an Excel spreadsheet. So that is a slow process, but it gives me a direct contact with each customer. And it means I get to know their likes and dislikes and have some communication with them. And it also means that when I accept their order and I do an instant reply, I know I've got their order. So it does reduce the amount of mistakes that you make. So yes, a bit laborious, but if I get 75 different people ordering a week, it takes me 15 or 20 minutes and I think it's time well spent. So I, I, use, a, I use a fairly laborious system. But there are lots of automatic systems out there. You can buy ones that plan your delivery route and everything, but for me, old-fashioned email, direct contact and transfer onto a spreadsheet works extremely well. Any other thoughts on that question? The other thing you can do, which can help you, uh, I, I mean, to, to Ian's point, what I used to do is send, I had, um, you know, in, a list in, in MailChimp of customers and I would decide what am I baking this week? I'm going to do, you know, two different kinds of bread and bagels and, I don't know, almond biscuits. I'm making it up. And I would send that out with the prices and ask people to come back to me. That's that's how I did it. And like Ian, you know, I put it in a spreadsheet or wrote it down on a piece of paper and baked. The other thing I did as well was people had subscriptions. So they would pay for 10 loaves in advance right? It was always the same loaf. So I always knew that there were certain things that were coming that I didn't have to worry about because they had paid for 10 loaves in advance every single Tuesday or whatever. And, you know, that just was always there as a standing thing. So that's, that's an option, which is to, to kind of sell subscription, almost like a veg box, where you say to people, you pay X and you're gonna get one loaf of bread per week or two loaves of bread or whatever you're gonna get, a bundle of things per week and they pay you in advance and you bake and you deliver or they collect. So you could do one, you could do the other, you could do a bit of a combo platter, but certainly the order in advance makes the logistics easier for you and you get paid in advance. So that's always good. I, I think it all depends on the volume that you do. So it's, uh, you know, if you've got a manageable uh, number of customers who may, may order every week, not every week, whatever, um, but you've got a rough idea of how many, how many customer orders you do each week. And like I do, I give a limited specials list. So I'm not trying to bake one loaf from a list of 50 loaves. I've said, essentially, I'm really focusing on these 10 this week which they all know means choose one of those, or unless you're a very, very special customer. And um, so think about how you can best manage the situation. I think some of the ones I've seen where people are baking at bigger volume, which is quite a good way to do it, is to have a set um, delivery. So it's two loaves plus a, plus a special bun or whatever in a bag. And they, the, the baker has a, a, an interactive list of what they're baking and you just select one of, you select one or two of the orders. And so when you go to, the baker goes to one location, there's no delivery, the baker's just there with the van, you go and collect your numbered bag, it's all prepaid. So if you do get to that volume, you, that system's brilliant. I've just never got to that, if I've got to that volume, it's a market, not, not a direct sale. So that's another way to do it. Thank you. 
Thank you. Right, so we'll go back to the uh, the written uh, Q&A. So if anyone's got any of those, you want to jump in some quick fire answers, just any of those, please. And for the people who are uh, attending this live, there's the chat function. Uh, a few people are saying, how do we stay in touch with each other? Um, there's, uh, for those of you who are Real Bread campaign supporters, we have a Facebook forum. Uh, you're very welcome to join our Facebook group. Uh, if you're not a Real Bread campaign supporter, please do join us uh, to support our charity's work. Uh, and also just for now, during this, this live event, uh, you can add your contact details there, but obviously please bear in mind that you are sharing your contact details with 200 odd probably complete strangers. So that's, that's up to you. Uh, so any questions that people want to take from uh, the Q&A panel? Uh, I've put my hand up for a couple of quick ones, if nobody else wants to jump in. Um, somebody asked specifically how many loaves I do a week. Um, I now only produce once a week, and it's between 100 and 150 loaves, loaves which I deliver on a Thursday evening. So that's just my methodology um, in terms of time invested, concentrating into one delivery round a week seems to work pretty well. And there's been a few questions about um, legal status, sole trader, small company, etc. I think really a lot of us are sole traders um, because it keeps it simple. You can do your own bookkeeping or you can employ someone to do it. Obviously, liability is the big difference. If you're a sole trader, you are 100% liable for what you do and you are the business financially. Whereas if you want to limit your liability, then you might be looking at setting up a small company. Um, there's a lot of issues in there, but Soul Trader works extremely well for a lot of micro bakeries, I would say. Okay, I had a couple of uh, questions which I saw. Uh, one was a question about uh, B2B and B2C uh, income split. Um, so wholesale and customers, very different um, in my experience. Um, my personal experience is more as a consumer. Therefore, I feel I'm better placed to be able to go direct to consumer. Um, I don't have a wholesale background. Um, and so my wholesale uh, relationships I have are quite close ones, deliberately so, and I only have a few. Um, you, you do tend to find that some wholesale customers can just drop you like a, like a bad smell um, and sometimes just disappear without paying you. Um, and that's something to, to bear in mind. Whereas customers, you can get that relationship there, um, particularly on a repeat basis, and that's been easier for me. Um, someone's asked about menu planning. Uh, I've got an ideas book. I'd recommend getting it just a, a notebook, write ideas on the front. Anything that you see on social media or in a recipe book or whatever that looks quite interesting to you, just write it down. Um, I've actually got a, in terms of flavor pairings, I've got a book called... Um, Flavor Thesaurus by Nikki Segnet, who's which is amazing. So if you if you feel like there's a you're in a bit of a rut for ideas, then that's a really good idea. Um, and then someone asked about time management. How do you do it? Well, I found trial and error works. Um, and then looking back at where you found your bottlenecks in time, and then just working from there. Um, that, that that's how I found it. Uh, I, I'll throw one in here. Um, it's um, what, what, uh, what big mistakes, or actually, is it three key mistakes the panelists have, have made along the way? I would sort of slightly change that to maybe one each and what, what you learn from that uh, very quickly. Oh my God. So many. <laughs> so many. So many. Loads. You can't learn, you cannot learn to be a baby without making mistakes. And I think this is one of the things that gets missed from Instagram and all those beautiful things like Matt was saying, is that um, because it is, uh, it's not something you're grown, you're not grown up learn, you know, unless you're very lucky having grown up with someone who knows how to bake, it's a new skill. And you have to experience it and you have to have things that go wrong. And I've had, um, you know, I had that day when the oven wouldn't light 
um, because of the atmospherics, it was very damp and it was very cold. And I just was producing charcoal in there. I couldn't get the oven. You know, it took hours and hours and hours and hours. I was crying by the end of it. Mm. But eventually I did it and I managed to deliver everyone's bread by about 10 o'clock at night. Um, I, I mixed ciabatta once and just wasn't paying attention. And I literally produced this slop that when it was in a bin bag was like a decomposing human body. And I don't know how it managed to, it managed to go in the bin. You know, there's... I've made so you know I've, I've turned up at markets with only like twenty loaves because I destroyed the rest of them. So you know, be prepared. N none of us got here because it was all perfect. We mm. we've made a lot. I've made a lot. I, I don't know about the rest. Sorry, I shouldn't speak on behalf of the rest of the panel. <laughs> it's a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I I totally echo that. And mistake mistakes are good as long as you know the main beneficiary of that mistake is you. My my biggest mistake is doing a test bake that was going to be sold directly to customers the next day, which, mm -hmm. which is a, which is a massive no, no. Mm -hmm. And I learned that early doors. And that was with a, uh, a roasted garlic sourdough. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, garlic plus bread equals glorious, yum. right? So, equals exactly. Yum. Absolutely. But so I spent about an hour roasting about a hundred heads of garlic, um, taking out all the pureed insides and folding it through the dough during the bulk ferment. And it was taking ages um, and ages and ages. I think I went through about 15 or so turns of the dough. It's now sort of 3 a.m. By this point, so I'm on a 23 hour day and I'm wondering why it still hasn't risen. And of course, garlic's an antimicrobial it killed off all of the sourdough um so i had to totally start again but and it meant i had 20 kilos of glorious uh, garlic sourdough pizza base so it was able to be repurposed but it meant it was a very long night uh for me uh in terms of getting something out for the customers the next day so yeah mm -hmm. don't test bake before sat on, a, on something you intend to sell <laughs> yeah and to that point let me build on that point that everybody everybody on the call just i would like you to focus on the following statement you will get fat <laughs> because you will eat everything <laughs> that comes out of the oven until you're confident that it will come out of the oven as well every time so i don't know about and i i am pretty certain everybody here um has performance anxiety with their first like new product or their first loaves are they good enough you bake two loaves and you're selling one and then you eat the one to try the second so that is part of it so you, you are going to get a little fat but you know it'll come off when you stop having performance anxiety in terms of mistakes i think i probably the, made the mistake of having trying for too much variety um, and, and that is, adds a lot of complexity to your day when you have too many kinds of dough and they're going to rise at different um, rates and they have to bake at different temperatures and you don't have enough space and, and, and trying to e even trying to have like a base with, oh, and one person wants raisins and one person wants seeds and one person wants, it's like, what are you doing? What are you doing, Jane? What are you doing? So I think the biggest mistake I made and the biggest learning I had was really cut down on complexity, cut down on variety. And, and also, um, I think everybody needs to play to their strengths. So there have been a few questions through the Q&A about sourdough, like, is sourdough really better? Is it better? Does it sell better? Is that what people want? Um, if you don't want to bake sourdough, don't bake sourdough. You can turn out fabulous, very strong tasting, tangy bread with a wonderful kind of um, pungent and unjoint mouthfeel with yeast. You just have to learn how to put it together properly. So if you don't want to do sourdough, don't do sourdough. If you don't want to do rye, don't do rye. If you don't want to do wheat, don't do wheat. Um, you know, you really want to minimize, I think, the variety to minimize complexity, and you really want to play to your strengths. They're going to be stuff that you love baking. Bake that, because that will be consistently amazing, and the love that you have for it will come through in the final product. 
I'm going to take a question now. Uh, I'll come back to you in, in a sec, Ian. I'm going to take a question because I've noticed uh, someone called Jane Bridgman has posted lots and lots of questions. And I'm not sure we've uh, come to any of them. So, Jane, I'm going to uh, uh, let you... Uh, right, Jane, I think uh, you're here now. So please um, ask, what's your most burning question of all those questions? We'll <laughs> yeah, there are quite some... a few there. Um, I just was uh, trying to also add a few thanks to various people from the panel. Uh, one of the key things, or two quick, two or three key questions. One is if you're supplying like a little small deli or a farm shop for people maybe out of London, other than me. I mean, what is the sort of typical price point that if you go to a, go to them with saying, oh, well, I want to sell this set of four rolls for two pounds. What would they make in terms of their uh, markup on that? Second question, I'll fire off three. It gives you a chance to have a little think. Another question would be in terms of the scaling up from that, you know, from the Hobart to the spiral. I mean, is growth, because as most people attending will probably be aware of, there's been a huge uptick in interest in artisan baking over the pandemic. So is growth likely to be so positive because of the last 18 months interest that you shouldn't really even be looking at such a small size mixer as a, you know, 12 port Hobart or whatever, or, you know, what's the entry level mixer for most people? That could be something others want to know. And uh, I guess on the third question, um, I'm, I'm curious about the suppliers of some of the more niche bakery supplier ingredients uh, access to it over the last year was seemingly a bit strange and I think that they were I don't know if other panelists found that there was um, a kind of sausage effect or a, a kind of backlog of interest a huge amount of interest and lack of the speed of supply with Brexit and getting hold of some ingredients at a, at a decent price was quite challenging um, to say the least so if anyone knows of a great Priced wholesale price, for example, on egg, egg whites, powdered egg, egg whites. I'd love to know. Um, Thank you. So three questions there. So we'll try and rattle through. Uh, well, does anyone on the panelists want to grab any of those? So there was one on markup pricing. Again, sort of going back to something we've covered earlier. Really, is how do you work out your prices? Um, um, then there was something on a, an entry level mixer. Uh, and then there was another one. I think the other one is probably sort of more, yeah, current access to ingredients has been challenging. Um, what sort of issues you found in, around that? Ian? Yeah, I think Sonia was first in with, maybe not the one I was going to oh, answer. Sorry. Oh, I can see you. Go Sonia. for it, Sonia. Go for it. Um. I think that the um, there's a there's a couple of things. I think the thing about the relationship with delis and supplying wholesale is you have to sit down and work out. Um, you know, you know what your retail price is. You are never ever going to sell your retail price into a wholesaler. So you work out the percentage you're going to take off your product that still makes a profit for you. And um, most wholesale most people you sell to will not make a fuss if they know that they can sell in volume and make so much on each item um, and if they're going to be using your products so they're not reselling them but they're using their products in their meals you can often if you know them very well they will buy it at the retail price because mm -hmm. they they know that they're going to make money on every every meal so do some thinking before you go in. So don't, so don't go there and start, you know, it's not like Dragon's Den, but sit down and work it out on a piece of paper. You know, my view is most people I've ever worked with in wholesale or in restaurants or in delis, so long as you go in very down to them that it's the wholesale price of everything that you are prepared to do for them, they're really genuinely quite happy just to go with it. They won't quibble over every single item. Um, and my, my other point, one thing I wanted to say about supply, if things are difficult to get hold of, make something else. Don't tie yourself up in knots chasing down egg whites. You know, find something else. Um, we did it last year, you know, yeast was 
um, had disappeared, we started fermentalizing and making ferments and having a bit of fun with it. So, uh, all right, sometimes this is not always commercially sustainable, but you could make a bread without raisins in it, you know, if, there were, if raisins were at a premium. So. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, just to similar point on wholesale, um, I very quickly learned, and there's something I said earlier that if a wholesale customer wants you to discount your price by a seemingly unrealistic amount, then you say no. So the only wholesale customers that I said yes to were the ones who would pay retail or near to retail. And you've just got to be a bit hard nosed about it because if they, if they want to undervalue your product, that's not my customer. That's not who I want to sell to. Um, so the only wholesale ones I have provided are ones who've paid what I think the bread is worth. Um, and just a very specific one, a mixer. I would say your mixer is a key bit of kit and you need to get a big enough mixer to cope with future growth. And in my experience, most spiral mixers will go down to 10% of the bowl size. So my 40 litre mixer will mix a four kilo dough quite happily. It takes a little bit longer. I might be holding a bit of the moisture back, but it will do it quite adequately. So mix the size down to 10%, but don't, don't be upgrading bits of kit in the first six months, 12 months, because mm -hmm. try and think about that expansion because mostly the demand is there. You will grow if you want to grow. That's not going to be a problem in my experience. Uh, does anyone have any uh, points uh, on the uh, James third question, which is uh, access to ingredients? I think that's kind of a bit time specific, really. That's uh, things have been different over the last year or so, and hopefully they're going to get better. But I don't know if anyone's got any points, Matt. Yeah, it was it was just um, hang on in there and see who else is selling what. I mean, this this is something that affected everybody uh, last year, just like Sonia. Yeast was an absolute nightmare for me to get uh, last year. The benefits are that actually you can find better suppliers. Um, inadvertently, I've, I've managed to get some good relationships with some better suppliers off the back of that. Um, you know, that's uh, and that's just how that's just how it goes. I, I think really just cast your net out and see and see what's there. That's my that's my advice there. Um, I think we haven't done much on deliveries. There's a few questions around deliveries. Is anybody any sort of thoughts on 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 deliveries? Sort of. Uh, Someone's asked for about outsourcing. Other people have asked about, uh, I think we've mentioned of bike deliveries and things here. Has anyone got any thoughts on, on uh, deliveries? Oh boy. Right. Well, yeah, don't use delivery or Uber Eats. Um, not because um, I want to slate a company, but just have a think about the cut that they'll take. Um, you know, they, they are businesses and they are hard-nosed businesses and have a think about what your, what your brand ethos is all about. If you are a, uh, a small local, uh, low volume, small batch, uh, producer who is using a company which, uh, may or may not put, uh, their employees rights, maybe further down their own priorities list, um, that will reflect on how your customers see you. Uh, I personally deliver, deliver everything. Uh, and, uh, that for me is, it's part of it. Uh, you knock on the door, you can hear them shout the bread man, the bread man. Um, and, and, and that's great. You're asking about their week. How have they, how have they been? You've noticed when they've cut the lawn, when they've, when they've got a new car or whatever, you can talk about their lives and it's, and it, it adds to the service that you're providing. And that's something which they, they are paying a premium for. Anyone else? Sonia's hand is up. It's just, it's blending into your bricks, oh, Sonia. It's blending so into your really bricks, your yes. Hand. I think Ian was before me anyway. Ian, you had um, a point before. I, I was literally going to say what Matt said. I, I deliver. I love it. It's contact with the customers. And I think it's more carbon neutral than everyone coming to you. So, you know, I charge 50p if people order one loaf, but if they order two or more, I have a fixed delivery route and I drop it off, it works really well. But yeah, just that, thanks Sonia. Uh, I was gonna say that I now do, I do both. So I, um, I, have, I have a fixed delivery that is based on 
historically the, the friends that I was prepared to deliver bread to after the school run. So, because my kids sort of left the primary school and now go to another school. So I didn't do the school run into the village anymore, but I did do a little route round and I was prepared to deliver to certain people who always did a good order. Um, now, since, since last year, where I suddenly got a lot of new customers, I've said collection only. And this is where to my advantage because they do a big order and collect. So they might not come every week, but they do a big order. And um, it, it's taken the pressure off me because I'm in a rural area. The, the delivery route potentially could have been two or three hours long. And it's all right when it's with friends, but when everyone wants to chat, it, you know, and I'm actually, I have to say, I've developed a great skill. I can sneak into most people's houses without disturbing the dogs, which is something I didn't realise I could do. <laughs> but, you know, you have to factor that in. If, you're, if you want to spend a e whole evening chatting to lots of people on a different, that's great. And I do chat to my friends, but I didn't want to talk to every single customer every time. And I still have a chat to them when they come and collect. So. Right, so back to the uh, written questions. Um, are there any things the panellists have spotted that you uh, think, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. It feels like mock the week. Does anyone want to jump in on that one? There, there was one which I saw which was related to delivery and it was to do with delivery windows, whether we, whether we guarantee uh, delivery time slots for people. Um, I don't, um, I'll, I'll give a general idea of when it will be. So whether that's early afternoon, late afternoon, early evening, or early morning, late morning, so that people have got a general idea of where they're going to be. Uh, and then with the recommendation, they put a box outside or give me, re um, some sort of tips on where to leave it, that where it's not going to get wet or whatever, if they're out. Uh, but I don't do a guaranteed time slot. Um, and I have had some customers who have really tried to push hard on that for, I think one person asked for a delivery within a sort of like a, a specific 15 minute time window and it's not sustainable. Um, so <laughs> that's not something which, which I do. I'll, I'll give a, a, an afternoon slash evening slot, but not even Amazon can deliver it to the hour guaranteed. Anya. And see your hand. I I wanted to just there were a couple of questions on the um, on the Q and A about ingredients and allergens, um, and I can see that Liz Wilson has actually put quite a good reply there. But I, I just want to say that please, what what which where, whichever country you're in, you will have a food standards agency um, of some type. Go to that website. And also have a look at trading standards, all right? You, as a, as a normal everyday person, you're allowed to look at those websites. You don't have to be in a business to, to look at them. And make sure, the only thing that you really need to make sure is you tell your customers exactly what's in your product and um, what it may have come into contact with. And there are set guidelines for what you must declare and you must do it. You can't just sort of, avoid them or just say well only that bread's got sesame seeds on you know you've got to you've got to follow the guidance um and so and be very honest about things that you can't do i got endless requests for things without this in that and i said i can't do it it's one oven everything goes on the same oven floor so in theory nothing um should be left of like any allergen on you know they try not to touch them but i don't know and so, and it's only one pair of hands working in here, anything can happen. So if you've got a severe allergic reaction to garlic, which is not one of the named allergens in the UK, I can't make bread for you because garlic is in the bakery. So be very straightforward uh, because you, you do not want to be in a situation where someone will say, but you said it was safe. All right, so be very honest about what you do. And all of these guidelines are not there to trip you up, they're to stop um, you having a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I, Sonia, you're absolutely right. And, and let me just build on that. It's the same with gluten-free. Okay. So if people come to you and they say, I'm, I'm intolerant or I'm a celiac, can you make me gluten-free bread? Um, the answer is probably yes, I can, but I don't have a gluten-free kitchen. 
And you really need to be operating a separate facility because of cross-contamination. So in the case of sesame or garlic or gluten-free or anything, I, I think there's something about, yes, you must by law declare what is in the bread that you have in front of you that you're selling. Um, it may be that you just for full disclosure purposes also want to say, these are the kinds of things that I have in my kitchen. And, and, and it's there, it could be in a sticker, it could be if you're at a market, it's a poster, but it's just, you know, even if I have no bread on the counter today that has sesame or garlic or whatever, I regularly bake with sesame, I'm baking in my home kitchen, I have it in the cupboard. So I think there's what you need to do by law, there's what you may choose to do if somebody asks you for something very specific, you can say, yeah, as I say, I can make gluten-free bread, but I am making it in the same kitchen as I am making bread with flour that has gluten. Or yes, I can make you a loaf that doesn't have sesame seeds, but please understand that there are sesame seeds in the kitchen. Please understand that there is garlic in the kitchen. So honesty, as Sonia says, is the best policy and being more forthcoming is, is smart, right? It's smart, nobody wants to kill anybody. So it, it's smart. Something just from a campaign point of view, we encourage all bakers and retailers to declare absolutely everything that they put into every loaf, whether the law yeah. requires them or not. And I know some people find that challenging, uh, although when you're just making flour, water, salt or flour, water, yeast and salt, it's a smaller ingredients list than a lot of supermarkets have. Um, but yeah, just to underline the point that has already been made, please check locally with uh, the, the, the either the, the national or the, or the regional um, body in charge, Food Standards Agency, and find out what the laws are. And in the UK, Food Standards Agency has guidelines on labelling. There are different labelling requirements, whether you sell something unpackaged. Uh, there's a category called pre-packed for direct sale, which mm -hmm. uh, microbakers often fall into because it's you making it and retailing it directly to the customer. Your company is making it and selling it. Um, and then there is unpack uh, sorry, pre-packed um, so that's your, your wrapped slice loaves, or if your product is being sold by a third party, there are slightly different rules uh, in the UK in October, I think it is. The rules for the pre-packed for direct sale are actually changing, so it's going to be closer in line with pre-packed products. Uh, it's, a, it's been called Natasha's Law because after many of us have been campaigning for years and years and years to have full ingredient labelling on all loaves, sadly it took um, Natasha Ed and LaBruce La dying before the government listened to uh, people and it was introduced for, from an allergen labeling point of view, but you actually will have to put full ingredients lists on everything you pre-pack for direct sale. Uh, go to the government website for the full advice on that. Um, Ian, you've got your hand up. Just a new question um, on the Q&A from, I think it was Sandra, saying that during the pandemic, she was baking to order every day, allowing people to bake order every day but she needs to transition more to people ordering on specific days. And how do you do that without losing customers? So just one way I would recommend is do an online survey, write it, send it to those people and ask them the question, but give them the options of the days that you are willing to produce bread on. So you don't say to people, which day would you like to buy bread on? Because you'll get seven days of the week. But if you give people a small number of selections on the days that you are able to produce it and say, would you like it on a Friday or a Saturday, then you will get the majority into the days that you're willing to produce it. But of course, that won't suit every customer. But if that's the days you can produce it, then they're not your customer. They may arrange for somebody else to collect it for them, etc. So just one way to do it, an online survey, but give limited options in questions. Don't ask open questions limited to the things you can achieve. Right, uh, we've got uh, about 10 minutes or so left, so uh, we'll, we'll do some quick vibes. I'm about to, uh, for those of you attending live, I'm about to talk to a poll, basically just asking you, did you find this event useful? Uh, and what topics might we do for a future event? Uh, and how could we improve things? So I'll launch that now. Uh, it'd be great if those of you attending live can uh, give some answers there. Um, we fill that in as well, Chris. <laughs> uh, you're very welcome to. Please, please. 
Uh, and yes, are there any questions that uh, the panelists want to pull out? Just to let you know that uh, poll actually only runs a half minute, which I didn't realise. Sorry, a minute. I didn't realise that. So yeah, everyone attending this live, please uh, answer that, those questions now. Uh, that'd be fantastic. I thought it was just going to run and run and run, but there we go. There's a, some technical technical issues uh, with this event, the main one being me. What's fantastic in the Q and A is how many people have chipped in with answers uh, outside it's, of the panel. Which is that's something I, I forgot to mention. Actually, yes, for, for those of you attending live, uh, the Q and A function you you can actually share information with each other. I, sorry, I should have pointed that out earlier. Some people have spotted that, but you can answer each other's questions as well, which is handy. Um, Lovely to see that 99% uh, of you say uh, you found this useful, which is uh, <laughs> very reassuring. Um, maybe we'll do something similar again, hopefully in real life one of these days as well. Um, yeah, so going back to the questions, uh, do any of the panelists want to pull any more of those out? There was, um, there was one person asking on how to structure uh, their working week uh, due to ill health they've had to restrict their hours I think um, uh, my thoughts are just to have a look at what your intended volume is looking to be or rather how much money you're looking to make turn that into loaves turn that into a, a baking schedule and see whether it's feasible the fact that you said you've, you've dropped down to only five days a week means <laughs> I mean you know that's a that's a full working week anyway so um, uh, if you're going to be working nine to five or uh, eight hours a day for that, that, that should give you ample time to, um, you know, structure, structure your day in order to create, you know, a, a decent living out of that. Um, but really, it's a case of your own personal circumstances, really. Any more for any more? Oh, Sonia. There were a few um, questions about a similar thing uh, that, that seemed to be about a similar thing, which was about competition. So what if you're a micro baker and there's another one two streets down and how do you, how do you get along without um, it coming to fisticuffs or whatever? I think the honest answer is, and I, I was also reading there that someone is making bread and they seem to have had a drop in, in sales because of like local competition or the supermarket changing their product range. The answer is, if your product is good enough, baking is a long game, okay? I've been overrun, at, like I told you, the guy at the, the market who followed me around every single market and turned up with a stool next to mine. Um, I went to one market where the um, owners of the, or the people that ran the market um, just let anybody set up a store. So we ended up with five bakers, including I think six actually at the end, because one of them was uh, gluten free. Um, you have to take, you just sometimes have to take some of those on the chin and think again about, you know, if your product is good enough, where is the person that wants to buy it? And you keep going and you'll find, you will find that other market. Um, you just can't avoid those those snarl ups where you know you can be you just have to be polite about it you just have to be nice about it sometimes you won't sell so well sometimes the other person won't sell so well but you know if you really believe in your products and bake it's a long game and like I can say that now because I'm still here but um, you know don't get disheartened just if for a period of time People won't, hang on one second, but, but don't get disheartened. Just think again about where, where else or who else would be interested in your product. And I'm sure that your bread is good enough. You know, it's not the bread, it's the circumstances and the environment. Find the next environment. Yeah, can I just add to that, that I, when I first started selling bread, there were no direct competitors in my village um, but since doing so I now have a shop selling 
sourdoughs immediately in the middle of the village. And I've got two bakeries delivering potentially into this area as well. But I think that was what I was saying right at the start about it's your personality and all those other things in your bakery that your customers will come to you for. So good communication, good explanation, good ethos, that gets you a market. And, and if that fails, there's always a niche in bakery, isn't there? There's always something you can do slightly different, whether it's, you know, what are the new fads for cruffins or the rest of it. But there's always something you can do that's different. So, yeah, you can always be there. Thank you. So uh, um, I've noticed the, uh, for those of you watching, watching live, uh, the poll is actually still live. Uh, so it'd be great if a few of you haven't done that. That'd be great feedback if you let us know please. Um, there is actually a micro bakery page with some starting points on the Real Bread campaign website and um, this is a launch event for the crowdfunding campaign for Needs No More which is the updated and expanded 10th anniversary edition of our micro bakery handbook. There have been about 5,000 people including some people on this call I'm sure, uh, in fact I know, uh, who've, who've used that and some of whom have found it very useful. Uh, hopefully the new edition will be even more useful. I think pretty much every question that's been asked today uh, we've covered to, to one degree or another in that new book. Uh, if you're watching this live or during July 2021 please do head to our crowdfunding page and pledge today. Uh, we launched the uh, the, uh, the crowdfunding campaign yesterday as, as, I'm, as I'm recording this and uh, we're actually already up to about 76% of our basic target which is brilliant thank you to everyone who has pledged. Uh, the more we get uh, the more we can do we can not only print more copies but we hopefully it will help us to do things uh, to, to produce more events uh, and not rely on the goodwill uh, of, of our panelists every time for volunteering their time and services so uh, that would be uh, fantastic to actually uh, <laughs> give some people some cash for their knowledge and time and skills. Um, so, yes, uh, anyone want to take a few more questions? Quick questions, quick fire. We've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, before I do that, I, I just do want to thank our panelists because I can see that uh, people are drifting away at this point, uh, which is fair enough after two hours. Uh, so thank you so much to Jane Mason, uh, to Sonia Handel, to Ian Wasserland and to Matt Townley. Um, and thank you to everyone who's attended. Uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, watching this as a recording and is still sitting here watching it. That's, uh, I think, it's even more impressive, two hours of a, of a, of a recorded webinar. Um, but yeah, any, anyone else want to make any final points or, or grab any of those final questions before we- Yeah, uh, there, was a, there were some various questions about how do I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm baking for a market or I'm baking for a festival or I'm baking for the church fate and how do I not stay up all night? And how do I kind of pad in my, you know, my, my stall in the morning um, when bread takes X amount of time? And, and actually there are loads of things you can do. So the first thing you can do super legitimately, you can bake rye bread the day before because rye bread is actually better on day two, not even day one, day two. <laughs> so you could do 100% rye bread or a high rye quantity and super legitimately, you can bake it on Friday and sell it on Saturday. Okay, you can even bake it on Friday morning and sell it on Saturday morning, it will not be stale. The second thing you can do is a whole range of quick breads. So you could do soda breads, you could do scones, um, you know, with cheese scones, cheese soda breads, whatever, you know, things with raisins or, um, you know, cranberries or whatever you wanna do. So those are three ideas of things that you can do to kind of pad out your patch um, when it comes to if you need to do that. I had a, uh, a question on here that I just saw regarding passing off. So somebody was selling to uh, a local chef and that chef has now been uh, not, uh, she, she or he is no longer supplying to this chef, but the chef is saying that it's still their bread. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's naughty if that's uh, if that's happening um and i would do some more investigating because uh uh in fact yeah my my commercial wife uh well commercial solicitor wife uh in the background is uh, shaking her head that's a big no-no trading standards mm -hmm. uh, 
any more for any more. There's quite a few questions about people, you know, what's an acceptable number of loaves? They're only doing four or six or a dozen. Well, if it works for you, it works. I wouldn't worry about numbers at all. It, if, like um, I think Jane said, and maybe Sonia as well, it's, it's what you want out of it. So if it's, if it's working for you, ticking whatever boxes you need to tick, then that's fine. It's not about the number of loaves that you're doing at all. It's what you need in return from your loaf, which might be satisfaction, it might be cash, it might be both. So there's no right answer to that. Yeah, one. I, think we, I think we have to kind of, you know, we've got to move away from this sort of machismo around baking, you know, big, big, you know, I'm working with, 50 kilos of dough, I sling it on the table, I do this, you know, I'm just hundreds and hundreds. You know, it doesn't make, you know, you, you made four people happy this week with four beautiful loaves. You've done a fantastic job. Um, I started selling my bread in, um, you know, like supermarket group and forced people to buy them. So and that was only 20 loaves and I've come home with, probably only sell 10 and come home with 10. So, you know, be a bit, be a bit brave with the fact that you're really good at this thing. You know, it is a skill. Absolutely, and don't get overfaced by uh, some of the social media shots with the, you know, the the crumb shot with the. Yeah, well. uh, uh, the the crumb shot with the you know ninety five percent hydrated dough with uh, aerated crumb with holes as big as your fist. Let's think in practical terms. Your customers want to cut it into slices and slice and spread <laughs> bread or uh, butter all in it. If it's just going to go through the holes, what's the point of it? Basically, the purpose of that post is like a Mr. Universe contest. It's for aesthetics only, and it serves no other purpose than that. Um, same thing with uh, with styles of uh, bread. I got myself worked up for far too long trying to get that all-important perpendicular open ear on the loaf when it came out of the oven using steam. If you've got a, you know, a wood burning oven like, uh, like Sonia, you know, can't you can't, you, you can't do it, but, <laughs> but you end up, with, you end up with a totally different product, which is yours. And that's yeah. the difference between Sonia's and my bread. And if you want that well-fired, crispy, dark, rustic loaf, then that's, that's the difference between Sonia's and, and my, my steam bread. I can, uh, do some, I can also do some beautiful delicate ones now. I have got that, that level of skill. But, you know, I think, I mean, <laughs> Matt, you've got, you, you know, you're right. It's um, who are you selling to? Who is your customer? Do they, want, do they want you to give them the loaf that you cut in half to take a picture of? Or do they want something else? Do they want something to eat? Okay, so think about that. It's always nice to do a good picture, but who... I always, whenever I see them, I think that's a loaf that wasn't sold. That was a muffin that wasn't sold. A crust in a croissant that wasn't sold. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's probably yeah. a good place to end. We could go on for a lot longer and uh, it, it does look like there'll be a demand for something else for micro bakers uh, in the future. Thank you all again. Um, and there will be a recording of this posted on our website. Um, thank you and goodbye.